Nata hiyata no nato. The self is its own mainstay. Now the question is, how does that fit in with the teachings on gratitude? Well, basically, you look around at all your karmic debts. And some people say that a feeling of gratitude makes them feel warm and content, thinking about the kindnesses of other people have done them, makes them feel valued. But it's like playing roulette. You find yourself indebted to people who are really difficult sometimes. Other times you feel a natural inclination that you want to help the people who have helped you. It's all very uncertain. As the Buddha recognizes, not everybody's parents are virtuous and kind and generous and wise. Then you have karmic debts to some people you just really would rather not have anything to do with at all. And if the mind doesn't get trained, you're going to be continuing to find yourself placed in debt to other beings, other people. Because your life depends on a lot of other factors. When you're born as a human being, you're totally helpless. You have to depend on somebody to look after you. And there's the need for food and clothing and shelter, medicine. And there are a lot of beings who whose lives get taken away for that purpose. Other people who have to, have to work really hard. Building shelter is not an easy thing. Growing food is not an easy thing. Working in a clothing factory is not an easy thing. So we're in this position where we're dependent on a lot of other beings, a lot of other people. And on the one hand, you have to be grateful for the help, but on the other hand, you would rather not keep on putting yourself in that position where you have to be so dependent. Some people solve the problem by pretending that it's all a wonderful interconnected net, but you look at the suffering that's involved. It's not really all that wonderful. Other people deny that they have any debts at all. But that's like going down to the bank. You've borrowed a lot of money. Just tell them, okay, I don't have any debts to you anymore. The bank's not going to accept that. The debts are there. This is why you want to learn how to look inside so that you can make yourself your own mainstay. You can develop the qualities that you have. And all of us have these potentials inside. The potential for virtue, the potential for concentration, the potential for discernment. They're all here in one form or another. And so you start out by depending on whatever virtue you have, whatever concentration, whatever discernment you do have already. And then learn how to make it grow so that it's all around. And John Cha says that John Mun used to talk about making the practice into the shape of a circle. So that it's continuous that your virtue is continuous, your concentration, your discernment, they're all around. Because if you look at what you have right now, it's like a fence around the house where a lot of parts of the fence are missing. The animals can come in, thieves can come in, all kinds of things can come in, because the fence isn't all around. So you have to look at your virtue, and what areas are your precepts being kept, and what areas are they not being kept. Okay, you've got to work on those areas where they're not being kept. And as we're sitting here with our eyes closed, we're working on our concentration and discernment. We do have s some concentration already. Simply the ability to read a book, to follow a conversation, requires concentration. The question is how you take that concentration and you string it into longer periods of concentration. This is where mindfulness comes in, the ability to keep remembering. 
you've made up your mind, you've got to stay with the breath, but well, you've got to keep remembering that. That's the thread that holds everything together. Then you want to make the breath a good place to stay. So pay attention to how the breathing affects the different parts of the body. Notice what kind of breathing feels good in the chest, what kind of breathing feels good in the stomach, what kind of breathing feels good in the shoulders, in the legs, in the arms, in the head. Because the breathing does affect the breath energy throughout the body. So you want to learn how to become sensitive to that and learn how to adjust things in a way that's not too heavy-handed. Sometimes if you force things too much, you give yourself a headache or feeling of tightness in the chest. If there's a headache, think of your neck muscles relaxing, especially the muscles in the front, all the way down into the chest. If there's a tightness in the chest, think of the, the tightness just kind of spreading out and getting more dispersed out the arms, out the fingers. One of the best ways of developing concentration is just get interested in the is to just get interested in the breath energy. Exploring how this energy flows in your body. How do you make yourself more sensitive to it? What changes are good? What changes are not so good? And as you get interested in that issue. You find that it's easier and easier to stay concentrated because you've got something that, that you're learning, you're exploring. It's not just a matter of forcing the mind to stay here against its will. You want to make it more willing. Then as the sense of ease begins to develop, you want to learn how to make the most of that. How do you spread that through the body? And this way the con concentration becomes more continuous. You have to watch out, though, as things begin to settle down. There, there's a very natural tendency when things get comfortable in the body, you want to just sort of drift off. So try to prevent that by being as fully aware of the whole body as you can. And as for discernment, well, Discernment is not a textbook kind of thing where you're going to have a certain number of insights in a certain order. It's more a matter of dealing with whatever defilements come up. Anything that's going to come up and disturb your concentration, you treat as a defilement. As the Jamahabu once said, the defilements don't line up like children in a school. They don't come and call out their names. Something comes into the mind to distract you, and sometimes it's anger, and sometimes it's a delusion, sometimes it's greed, sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's lust. Sometimes they're heavy cases, sometimes they're light cases. Which means you have to be ready for whatever comes up and deal with whatever comes up. Learning how to recognize when. Some misunderstanding has come in and taken over the mind, where you suddenly have decided that you'd rather not be here with the breath, but rather be thinking about what you did last week, or what kind of dinner you're going to have tomorrow, or the people you're going to talk to in the next day. You have to catch yourself. Learn how to argue with those defilements. Sometimes the argument is simply, hey, this is not what we're here for right now, and that's enough. Other times you have to remind yourself. The drawbacks of that kind of thinking. Where is that going to take you? In other words, you have to learn how to pull yourself out. Sometimes you pull yourself back to the breath and you notice that the thought that had distracted you has created a pattern of tension in some part of the body. We allow that to relax, dissolve away, and the thought will go away as well. In other words, you have to learn how to use whatever tricks work. For freeing you, for at least temporarily, from that distraction. This is the beginning of discernment. 
And as you learn how to deal with one particular defilement, you can start developing a skill set for how you're going to deal with other ones, and then other ones. For example, with the hindrances, don't expect that they'll just come neatly in a row, starting with sensual desire, going on to ill will, and then sloth and torpor, and restlessness and anxiety or doubt. They don't line up in that way. They come willy-nilly. But the practice you gain in learning how to deal with whatever is coming up, that will serve you in good stead, and you can apply it to other defilements as well. They say that one time the king of Thailand came to see Lumbudun, one of John Mun's early students, and asked him what defilement should be dealt with first. And Lumbudun said, well, whatever comes up first, deal with that one first. And so in protecting your concentration, you're getting practice in developing discernment. It may not look like the list of insights that are, say, given in the commentaries. But those lists are artificial. They came later. The Buddha himself never taught those. And even though it may be convenient for explaining things in a classroom, you have to realize that, to use another analogy from the Forest of Giants, it's like going out to, into battle. Things in a, that happen in the battle are not going to come in the same list that they use, say, in a strategy course in a military academy. You learn basic principles, and then you suddenly find that some of the more subtle principles have to be used first, and some of the more blatant ones come later, depending on what's happening in the battle. Sometimes things come up that you haven't studied. Okay, You have to figure out how to deal with these problems on your own. This is how your discernment becomes more all around. It's based on the determination you're not going to let yourself get hoodwinked by these things, whatever comes up. And sometimes you find yourself equal to the task, and other times you don't feel quite so equal to the task, but still you do what you can. And that's how discernment grows. And this is how you become more and more your own mainstay, by developing the pen potentials you have inside and making them all around. And ultimately, as the Buddha said, you get to the point where you don't have to come back. You don't have to incur those debts anymore. I say the fully awakened one is someone who eats the alms food of the country without incurring debt at all. Up until that point, we're all incurring debts. So we have work to do to make ourselves really free. The blessing in this is that if you become that kind of person, then the people who give you alms, the people who give you help in any way, find that the results are multiplied many times over. In fact, this is one of the motivations the Buddha gives for getting rid of your defilements, is that other people who help you then receive great blessings that more than repay the help they give. This is the ultimate way in which you pay back your debts without incurring new ones. And it's only then that you're really free. In fact, in one of his verses in the Dhammapada, the Buddha talks about the Arahant as being akatanyu. It's one of those verses that's meant to shock. The word katanyu means grateful. Akatanyu means not grateful. But it also means knowing what has not been done, knowing has what not been made, i.e. knowing the unconditioned. You can reflect on that verse and find many levels of meaning. At the very least, it means someone who's made him or herself 
a genuine mainstay.